previously in the complete creation. Conclusively show us that in fact, 208 million evolutionary years were actually all one event a few thousand years ago. Thank you for continuing on this epic journey as we explore the creation evolution controversy from scientific, philosophical, and religious perspectives. We've been discussing the various dating methods uh, used by both the evolutionists and creationists, and now we have come to a question that is without a doubt in the top three of the most common questions I get asked. What about carbon dating? Doesn't it prove the Earth is millions of years old? There is a huge misunderstanding hiding in the shadows of this belief, and I would lay the blame for that at the feet of the media and anti-creationists spreading propaganda. It is a baseless claim, yet the majority of people believe it. Carbon-14 is radioactive and has a relatively short half-life of 5,730 years. It breaks down radioactively so fast that within 100,000 years, a drop in the bucket on the evolutionary time scale, it is basically gone. After 60,000 years, it is considered undetectable because there is such small amounts of it left. So with that little bit of information, ask yourself, who on earth was it that told you carbon-14 proves the earth is millions of years old? On what grounds did they make such a claim? They cannot make that claim. It is impossible to obtain ages of millions of years for anything using carbon-14 as a clock. So let's first take a look at this very important carbon-14 atom and the carbon-14 dating method. Various high energy rays coming from space and the sun in particular interact with the upper atmosphere of Earth. Now, the atmosphere is composed mainly of nitrogen-14, uh, seven neutrons and seven protons. And through a series of interactions between the high-energy rays and the nitrogen-14, some nitrogen atoms get transmutated into carbon-14, with six protons and eight neutrons. It is a radioactive form of carbon. Carbon-14 behaves chemically the same way regular, non-radioactive carbon-12 behaves, so it will combine with oxygen to become carbon dioxide. This radioactive carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants in photosynthesis and is used to build plant cells with what is now radioactive hydrocarbons. Animals eat the plants and absorb the radioactive carbon. So, congratulations! The plant and animal matter that you eat is all radioactive. And you are what you eat, so you are radioactive too. Now, obviously, when the plant, animal, or human die, they stop taking in carbon-14. The carbon-14 clock now starts as the carbon-14 radioactively breaks down into nitrogen. After a while, we can come along and measure the amount of carbon-14 remaining and can estimate the amount of time that has passed since the plant or animal died. So, several very important points to be made here. The carbon-14 radioactively breaks down quite quickly over time. So, the original amount of carbon-14 gets smaller and smaller over time. Now, at 100,000 years, it's all gone, or at least undetectable by our most modern and advanced equipment. So if we attempt 
to measure a plant that's been dead for 100,000 years, we will detect zero carbon-14 in that plant. In fact, depending on the equipment used, anything older than about 60,000 years will have such small amounts of carbon-14 left in it that our most advanced scientific equipment will have a hard time detecting it. So really, that's the ceiling we're working with here. After about 60,000 years, the measured car amount of carbon-14 will be such a small number that it will be within the error margins of the equipment spitting out the measurement. Flip that coin over for a second. If we measure carbon-14 amounts, say, up here on the scale, then we have a lot of confidence that we are measuring carbon-14 in the sample, and we know it is way younger than 100,000 years old. As you'll see in a moment, this point cannot be overemphasized. If we measure carbon-14 of any amount in the sample, then we know it is extremely young on the evolutionary time scale of millions to billions of years. One other point I'll mention and then come back to in more detail later on is it's a fascinating study in itself. If the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher in the past than today, then plants back then have more regular carbon dioxide available for consumption than the radiogenic carbon dioxide. This means it will skew the carbon-14 dating results because we would assume the carbon-14 scale started here, when in actual fact the original amount of carbon-14 was, you know, way down here. So instead of the clock starting at zero, the clock actually started at, say, you know, 10,000 years or something. We actually have multiple reasons to draw the conclusion that atmospheric carbon dioxide was magnitudes higher in the past than present day values. Now it's difficult to ascertain, but we'd be talking carbon dioxide levels between 10 to 100 times higher than today. So one should not be too quick to write off this date skewing effect. However, while this is a significant difference in the dates returned by carbon-14 dating, it has little impact on our overall argument here. Anything in the fossil or geological record should have no detectable amounts of carbon-14 in it, if it truly is even 100,000 years old, let alone millions of years old. It's, it's a simple test, really. So when we actually try to carbon date samples allegedly millions of years old, do we find carbon-14? The short answer is a profound and overwhelming yes. Now keep a rough count in your head, because we are going to look at hundreds of examples of carbon-14 in samples alleged to be millions of years old. For example, coming back to the Rate Project, which ICR and CRS has kindly made open access in the Rate 2 book, Dr. John Baumgartner took diamonds and ran them through radiocarbon testing. Now, why diamonds, you might astutely ask? There's a few reasons for this. Diamonds are made up of carbon. Radiocarbon labs return results in PMC values, percentage of modern carbon. In other words, they measure the ratio of carbon-12 with carbon-14. So diamonds are a perfect test to check if any of that carbon is carbon-14. Now another reason is because the advocates of deep time believe that the pressures involved in forming diamonds could only happen in the mantle of Earth. But the diamonds are found on the surface of Earth now. So they believe the diamonds were actually made some one to three billion years ago. Thirdly, diamonds are the hardest substance known to mankind and seal up quite nicely against any kind of contamination or loss of carbon-14. So the diamond samples returned PMC values of 0.1 to as high as 0.39%. Now you remember I, measure, I mentioned the measurement thresholds of radiocarbon equipment. This 
particular equipment known as accelerated mass spectrometry can detect you know, carbon-14 amounts as small as 0.01%. So these values were all 10 to 39 times higher than the minimum value the machine can measure. To say the least, this is astonishing proof that these diamonds are, and the Earth itself are, far, far less than 100,000 years old. In fact, once you have the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, it's pretty simple math to calculate an age based on uniformitarian assumptions. These diamonds would return ages of between 46,000 and 57,000 years old. Now, do I believe those ages? No, that's not the point. The assumptions for determining the ages are flawed. The point is that there is, by deep time standards, an astronomical amount of carbon-14 where there should be zero carbon-14. This strongly indicates it's a very young object. So let's say myself and other creationists are wrong. We claim the Earth is 6,000 years old, but this data shows we're in error by a whopping factor of nine. How could you creationists be so wrong? Well, being generous to the deep time advocates and using their youngest estimated age for those diamonds, combined with the oldest C14 age determined, the old Earth model is an error by a factor of 17,543. I'm willing to accept those carbon-14 ages and being an error by nine times my estimates of the age if you wish to accept those carbon-14 ages. You see, carbon dating is the friend of the young Earth creationists. In Baumgartner's chapter in the Rate 2 book on pages 596 and 597, you'll find a table of 90 different published examples of excess carbon-14 found in samples alleged to be millions to billions of years old. And that list, it is nowhere near exhaustive, even for that time. There was literally hundreds of examples available to Dr. Baumgartner at the time of publication in 2005. There has been hundreds of examples added since then, Dozens added to the list just by young Earth creation researchers. We now have examples of carbon-14 in samples from every part of the Phanerozoic, or the fossil-bearing layers of the evolution column. Carbon-14 has been found in measurable quantities in crude oil, natural gas, mammoth bones, fossil whale bones, marble, wood fragments, fossil seashell, fossil seashells, and carbon dioxide gas wells. Do you remember the fossilized log at the Creation Evidence Museum I mentioned in part 11 of this series? All three states had been preserved in the fossil, petrified wood, holified wood, and original woody material. I mentioned in passing how this was surprisingly common, as Vance Nelson, the author of the Untold Secrets of Planet Earth book series, and Harry Nyborg of the Big Valley Creation Science Museum in Alberta, had also documented multiple examples of fossil trees in the Alberta dinosaur beds, which had all three states preserved in them as well. I have also documented multiple such examples from the various coal beds of North America. Well, if we have original wood still preserved in the fossil, then that means it can be carbon dated. Vance Nelson teamed up with Brian Thomas from the Institute for Creation Research in Texas to publish a fantastic paper published in the Creation Research Society quarterly special iDino issue, spring of 2015. Now, considering most peer-reviewed journals charge you $30 access for a digital copy of one paper in their journal, I think a $12 charge for a paper copy of the entire journal that CRS charges is more than reasonable. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this issue in this lecture and probably the next couple of lectures because the findings published therein are so significant and profound. Let's start with Thomas and Nelson's paper, starting on page 299, where you'll get a big hint of things to come just in the title of the paper. Radiocarbon in Dinosaur and Other Fossils. In that paper, one paper, 
published by Creationary Researchers, so keep track of these numbers because you'll start to see where I get my numbers when I say hundreds of radiocarbon tests have been performed. This is one paper, and they report on 16 different samples taken from all throughout the Phanerozoic strata, and all of their samples returned high carbon-14 concentrations that cannot be explained by contamination. Now I've got their chart here, uh, but I've added one more column to show you the ages assigned to the fossils by the evolutionary time scale for comparison. Notice first of all that all of the fossils have all been assigned ages in the tens to hundreds of millions of years. Pretty simple then. There will be no detectable carbon-14 if the samples are even a fraction of those ages. Yet, here they give the percentage of modern carbon numbers, every one of which you can see is at least 20 times higher than the minimum detectable amount. In fact, the PMC value returned for Tectocaria renana is well over 1,000 times the minimum detectable level. This particular fossil is a fascinating one. When I was visiting Vance one day, he handed a little plastic vial with a flip top. He opened it up and said, here, smell this. Now, when a woman says, hey, smell this, it's usually a pleasant smell. If a guy says it, it's usually a warning. But of course, like an idiot, I just took the vial and took a deep whiff. <laughs> there was a faint but distinct fruity smell. What Vance had handed me was a vial holding the fossil, Tectocaria renana, a fossil fruit from coal seams in Germany alleged to be 11 million years old, but the fossil wasn't fossilized, it was mummified. And it was so well preserved, it was still giving off fruity smells. So not only did Vance send one of these samples in for carbon-14 testing, he also documented the lab results of testing for chemical esters in his phenomenal coffee table book, Flood Fossils. Vance had to send me these photos because my nieces love his books so much and they wouldn't let me have my copies of his books. His whole Untold Secrets series is phenomenal and I highly recommend getting them all, but here in his book, he shows photos of the mummified fruit commonly found in the German coal seams. You can also see the lab reports where they got a really expensive machine with a really sensitive nose to sniff the samples and identify some 30 different esters which were detectable, several of which were responsible for the fruity smell. So it still smells like fresh fruit, but it's 11 million years old? I don't think so. But Vance and Brian also had carbon-14 tests carried out on some fossil wood provided from the collection of my museum. The good Lord kindly and miraculously provided me several pieces of fossil wood from the first investigative expedition launched in the 1980s to polystrate fossil forests on Axel Hyber Island in the Canadian High Arctic. A mere 1,100 kilometers from the North Pole, there are numerous polystrate fossil trees eroding out of the hills. I'm going to come back to this particular fossil site because it is a fascinating site, fossil site, but for the moment I wish to stay focused on carbon-14 dating. So here's one of the pieces of Axel Heiberg fossil wood from my museum collection. Just looks like wood, doesn't it? That's because it is. You can cut it with a handsaw. The Inuit would build campfires with the wood and burn it. All this with fossil wood alleged to be 55 million years old. Well, wait. If it's that well preserved, then obviously it can be carbon dated, right? Sure thing. That's precisely what Thomas and Nelson did. And here it is in their tables right here returning a PMC of 0 0.71, 71 times the minimum detection thresholds for the radiocarbon tests, and returning a radiocarbon age 
that differs from the evolutionary age by a factor of 1,384 times. Here's some more wood samples, this time from fossil logs, which still had original plant matter buried among the dinosaurs in Alberta. It too returned high PMC values, showing it is not 70 million years old as claimed by conventionally assigned evolutionary ages. But notice that there are several dinosaur bones in their list. All of them have very high carbon-14 counts, showing that none of them are in the 66 to 70 million years old range, not even close. There should be no carbon-14 left in those dinosaur bones if they truly were even one million years old. Instead, using conventional assumptions, they are found to have carbon-14 levels showing a maximum age of tens of thousands of years old. I'm going to come back to Thomas and Nelson's most excellent paper because there's more dynamite in there, but I wish to temporarily visit some other carbon-14 research specifically on dinosaur fossils and amber found in dinosaur beds. In the 2006 Creation Research Society Quarterly, a peer-reviewed journal, Hugh Miller et al. published some of their findings in carbon dating fossil dinosaur bones, as well as their research developing alternative radiocarbon dating methods for amber, which is found in the dinosaur beds. You'll remember that Amber is basically fossilized tree sap. Amber is perfect for the carbon-14 job as its carbon content is much, much higher than all other fossils, even more carbon than the original preserved wood. Miller and his team from the Colby Center and the Paleo Group have been conducting carbon-14 test testing on dozens of samples from all over the world and all portions of the Phanerozoic record. It is with much sadness that I mentioned that Hugh Miller passed away in January of this year. And as it stands at the time of this recording, uh, the website is down. Now my fe fellow creationist Brock Lee kindly did some digging around and found out that apparently Hugh's grandson is working to get the site back online. And we'll hope and pray that he does because this website documents many years worth of exhaustive research. Carbon-14 tests were conducted by Hugh and the Paleo Group and other secular researchers, including some samples that were known to be contaminated to act as a bit of a control. And you can see here the radiocarbon dates plotted out for multiple dinosaurs and other animals, uh, even a couple of human fossils of Neanderthal man. Some were mammals like a saber-toothed tiger or mammoths, then tons of tests on dinosaurs, on dinosaur fossils. And do note that several of the points on this graph actually represent multiple carbon-14 tests. There was even a couple of C-14 tests done on what most people consider dinosaurs of the sea, like the Mosasaur. So my good friend Brock Lee compiled all of the carbon-14 dates uh, returned from all of these studies. Here Brock has kindly charted out all of these carbon-14 dates and if you look closely, you'll see that all of the dinosaurs return carbon of 14 ages younger than the Neanderthal man fossils. One of the top three questions I get right alongside the question, what about carbon 14? Is the question, did dinosaurs and humans live at the same time? I'm going to emphatically say yes. And... These carbon-14 dates are only one data point in a very, very long list of evidence and data points showing that, yes, people and dinosaurs most certainly did live at the same time. We'll come back to that in great detail. For the moment, though, please note 
that in all of the radiocarbon tests here, conducted here, of which this ch chart shows another 30 samples, 30, are you keeping track? All of these samples obviously had large amounts of carbon-14 indicating they were very young. Ironically, the Neanderthal man fossils had the smallest amounts of carbon-14 indicating those fossils were older than everything else. And all of the samples on that chart, uh, with the exception of the controls, which were known to be contaminated, would have less contamination than the Neanderthal fossils. Of all these samples, the Neanderthal fossils should have been the most prone to contamination of carbon-14. In other words, if contamination really were an issue, the Neanderthal fossils should have shown the highest level of carbon-14 in all of the samples. Frankly, the contamination argument is a joke. We'll look at the actual numbers in the next lecture so you can see just how much of a joke that argument is, but the fossils most prone to contamination actually had the smallest measured amounts of carbon-14. So you simply cannot attribute all these dozens of high carbon-14 measurements to contamination. That argument just does not work. All right, I'm out of time for this part. I hope you'll join me as we continue this journey, looking at the evidence that is going to get rather wild, shall we say. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. This is allegedly 67 million years old. What you are looking at here is basically dinosaur meat. Still stretchy and pliable. Obviously, lots of material here to carbon date, and without even running the tests, I'm pretty sure the radiocarbon date will disagree with the 67 million year old age assigned to that dinosaur bone. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.